Monday to be back, everyone, and here is Aussie News. Student exchanges plastic bottle for books in Indonesia. For the last five years, librarian Radin Roro Hendarti has been driving a mobile library, bringing books to children who will otherwise have no access to them in Indonesia's Java Island. She's not only fostering a culture of reading among the youth, but she's also reducing neighborhood trash. Radin's Trash Library allows children to borrow books in exchange for plastic cups, bags, and other waste that she collects and sells to buy more books. Nah, di tahun 2015 terjadi krisis uh, di mana we faced a crisis in 2015 when we were short-staffed and interest in visiting the library was declining. So in 2016, the local government provided us with a three-wheeler vehicle and donated some books. From there, we combined the two things. Provinsi Jawa Tengah dan Perpustakaan Nasional, kita mencoba mengkolaborasikan, menjalankan kedua-duanya dalam satu kegiatan. Ya. The 48-year-old originally started her Trash for Books library in her hometown in Muntan in 2014. Response was good at first, but a staff shortage and a tapering of interest put the initiative in jeopardy after a year. Then the local government and libraries stepped in and gave her a three-wheel truck and also some more books so that she could take her project on the road. Radan ventures out every weekday aiming to visit at least three different areas. For as little as one plastic bottle or discarded chashet, People can access the collection of some 6,000 books and borrow as many as they want. Residents typically borrow books for up to a week. She said she collects as much as 100 kg of trash each week, which is then sorted by library staff and sent for recycling or sold. Redden says environmental awareness has gradually grown in the village and she reckons about 75 of the inhabitants now participate in the exchange. She says by expanding the library to other neighboring villages, more people will be encouraged not to leave trash laying around. There are people around our neighborhood that still do not care about their waste. And they are target. Because our target is not only in one village, it is expanding now. We hope that people will be more aware of the environment. Kevin Alamshia, an 11-year-old avid readers, agrees. From what I can see, when there's too much trash, our environment will become dirty and it's not healthy. That's why I looked for a trash to rent a book. Gia Palupi, the head of the main public library in the area, said Radin's work complemented their efforts to combat online gaming addiction among the youth and promote reading. My message is, let us build a culture of literacy from a young age to mitigate the harm of the digital world. And we should take care of our waste in order to fight climate change and save the earth from trash. Thank you. We are promoting the importance of the digital library and of not letting them children become addicted to online games. And we keep reminding people about this all the time. The mobile library in the village is also under our management. It's not easy, we admit it's not easy, to emphasize the importance of libraries. The literacy rate for above 15-year-olds in Indonesia is around 96%, according to the World Bank. But a September report had highlighted that the pandemic may leave more than 80% of them below the minimum reading proficiency level identified by the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. Tests by OECD's Program for International Student Assessments, PISA, in 2018 showed at least 70% of the students could not reach the basic literacy benchmark, which put Indonesia in the bottom 8% of 77 participating nations. Indonesia environmentalists questioning the government commitment to tackle global warming. Dozens of environmental activists gather in the streets of Indonesia's capital Jakarta on November 5th, questioning the government's commitment to tackle global warming after it appeared to back away from pledges made at an ongoing UN climate conference. The protest came days after Indonesia's environment minister criticized a global plan to end deforestation by 2030 and cut carbon emissions as unfair at odds with the country's development plans. Environment Group says the government of Indonesia, home to a third of the world's rainforest, did not appear to be serious about cutting greenhouse gas emissions. 
Wahyu Perdana, an activist with local environment group Walhi, said Jakarta was paying lip service to tackle climate change while raising production of coal, the dearthiest of the fuels, causing global temperatures to rise. The government had raised its 2021 target coal output to a record 625 million tons from an initial target of 550 million tons, he said. This government claims that they can hit these targets by 2030, in my opinion, are unrealistic expectations that are paying lip service only to the global community. Indonesia is the eighth biggest emitter of greenhouse gas in the world, plans to phase out coal for electricity by 2056 as part of a plan to reach net zero carbon emissions by 2060 or earlier. An environment ministry spokesperson did not respond to the environment group's criticism. World leaders gather in Glasgow this week for talks to secure promises from countries to cut greenhouse gas emissions and keep the rise in the average global temperature to 1.5 degrees Celsius. Crossing the thresholds could trigger a cascading climate crisis, scientists say. Policies that enable deforestation are policies that pro-corporation, not pro-people, especially for the local communities who live off the forest. Singapore scholars appeal countries to put efforts to respond to global defiance. All countries around the world should make joint efforts to respond to global challenges as they are on the same boat and need to come together to take care of it, said renowned Singaporean scholar. At the 60th G20 Leaders Summit on October 30, Chinese President Xi Jinping called on G20 members to take a long-term perspective, improve the global economic governance systems and rules and make up for the relevant governance deficit. A distinguished fellow at the Asia Research Institute at the National University of Singapore, Kishore Mahbubani, used a simile to explain the abstract term of governance deficit, which was focused in President Xi's address to the G20 members. So in the past, when 7.8 billion people... Therefore, countries across the world should work together instead of taking care of themselves, said the scholar. And the problem is that the West... Mahbubani noted that several Western countries only focus on their own national interest, but ignore the common interest of all countries. Prime Minister of Japan says Japan will compile large-scale stimulus package in mid-November. Japanese Prime Minister Fumio Kishida said the government will compile a large-scale stimulus package around mid-November and aim to pass through parliament a budget by the end of this year. I myself will take the lead and work with the ruling party to compile a large-scale economic stimulus package around mid-November. Also, we'll aim to pass through parliament as soon as possible, by the end of this year, a supplementary budget and disperse this to the public as soon as possible. He added in a news conference after the ruling party winning the general election. Kishida also said Japan will seek to play a leadership role in promoting carbon neutral policies in Asia, such as by offering aid to the region and investing in clean energy. Japan will certainly stick to the goal of carbon neutrality by 2050 and take the lead for the target of zero carbon emissions for all of Asia. In order to realize such international promises with regards to economic measures, we will provide funds for a new framework to support Asia. This will also include investments in the area of clean energy, such as electric vehicle charging stations and manufacturing facilities for batteries. This will be one of the pillars of such investments. Japan has set a target of 2050 for becoming carbon neutral and Kishida believes, in the face of considerable public on opposition, that nuclear energy should remain an option. Kishida's conservative Liberal Democratic Party defied predictions and held onto its single-party majority in election, solidifying his position as head of the fractious party and giving him a freer hand in parliament. With recovery from the coronavirus pandemic, including supplementary budget taking priority, some had feared that Kishida, only in power for a month, could become another one of Japan's short-term prime ministers, but the election results, which set stocks surging in relief, will allow him to put his own stamps on policies ahead of an upper house election next summer. Taiwan Democratic Progressive Party hyping up of threats from mainland for seeking independence. The Democratic Progressive Party authorities hyping up of threats from the mainland for seeking independence is ill-intended and execrable. The authorities said recently, two news reports released by local media about Taiwan's defense department have drawn public attention. Chiu Kuo Chen, head of the department, is making a handbook on so-called civilian survival and shelter. 
which is expected to be finished by next March, to cope with what he called the threat of war. The department later said it will spend 4.1 billion new Taiwan currency or 147.27 million US dollars next year in launching three programs aimed at treating the wounded rapidly and effectively in wartime. At the current sensitive period of time when the situation across the Taiwan Straits is becoming increasingly complex and severe, the DPP authorities have kept rolling out preparedness messages for war and causing panic in the region, in the name of defending Taiwan. In fact, they are all intended to hype up the so-called threats from the mainland with the ulterior motive of pursuing independence. The DPP authorities' hyping up of threats from the mainland is entirely an act of distorting facts, reversing the cause and effect relationship. The mainland has always adhered to the part of peaceful development of cross-straits relations and made continuous efforts to promote development on both sides of the straits in the interest of compatriots on both sides. On the contrary, the DPP authorities have colluded with external forces and stepped up provocations for independence which has led to the damage of peace across the Taiwan Straits and the turbulent cross-straits situation. The military drills by the People's Liberation Army are aimed at the very few Taiwan independence secessionist and external separatist forces that are constantly provocative, not at our compatriots in Taiwan. In order to cover up its malicious intent to pursue independence and confuse the public, the DPP attempts to shift the blame onto the mainland and the motive behind is execrable. In fact, hyping up the so-called threats from the mainland is a consistent trick by the DPP authorities to seek independence in order to force the public in Taiwan to embark on the evil road of seeking independence with anti-China acts. Meanwhile, the DPP's political trick also hides its intention of seeking independence by relying on the United States. With the rhetoric of the so-called military threats from the mainland, the DPP authorities can step up to their allegiance to their masters in the United States, hand over the knife to the United States for its reckless intervention in the cross trades affairs, and purchase arms and weapons with the hard-earned money of the public in Taiwan. Such acts of serving as a pawn for outside secessionist forces is their striving to contain China with Taiwan actually undermine the fundamental interests of the entire Chinese people. China says Europe should not send wrong signals over Taiwan. Europe should not be sending wrong signals to the separatist forces in Taiwan. The Chinese Foreign Minister said after a delegation of the European Union Parliament met Taiwan President Tsai Ing-wen or it risked harming Sino-European Union ties. China expresses strong dissatisfaction and is strongly opposed to the European Union members of Parliament's Taiwan visit. We have already lodged solemn representations to the European side. The European side should correct its mistake, Ministry spokesperson Wang Wenbi told a regular media briefing, adding that China has lodged solemn representation to the European Union. China calls upon the European side to correct its mistake, do not send any wrong signals to the forces of Taiwanese separatism, and avoid causing serious damage to the China-European Union relationship. The delegation organized by a committee of the European Parliament on foreign interference in the democratic processes will discuss threats such as disinformation and cyber attacks. During their three-day visit, the ministry added, the European Union lawmakers' visit comes after Taiwan Foreign Minister Joseph Wu made a rare trip to Europe last month that angered Beijing, which warned the host countries against undermining relations with China. Taiwan welcomes first official European Parliament delegation. Taiwan welcomed the first European Parliament delegation to visit the island, calling the trip significant and its latest move towards stronger ties with Europe amid heightened tensions between Taipei and Beijing. Taiwan, which China claims as its own territory and has not ruled out taking by force, does not have formal diplomatic relations with any European countries apart from Vatican City, but it's keen to deepen ties with European Union democracies. In a statement, Taiwan's foreign ministry pointed to the great significance of the first official delegation from the European Parliament. Prior visits by foreign lawmakers have provoked China's anger. In this world, Taiwan counts as the very free and open democratic country that values the rule of law and free flow of information. In contrast, just across the narrow Taiwan Strait, China uses a comparably totalitarian approach toward its people and does not value the rules of free trade while also making people worried regarding the matter of disseminating false information. Taiwan is really on the front line. 
the three-day visit was organized by European Parliament Committee on foreign interference such as disinformation in democratic processes. Beijing residents dismiss government calls to stockpile daily necessities. Some Beijing residents say that they were confident about food supplies and so no need to stockpile, demissing a recent government guideline advising people to keep stores of basic goods in case of emergencies. <laughs> I heard about it. If you buy too many vegetables, they'll get rotten, right? Also, now when it comes to grains like rice and flour, you only need to buy what you'll actually eat. In Beijing, the capital, there won't be any problems. Chinese Ministry of Commerce published a seasonal notice encouraging authorities to do a good job in ensuring food supplies and stable prices ahead of winter, following a recent spike in the prices of vegetables and growing outbreak of COVID-19. But the ministry's advice to households to also stock up on daily necessities in case of emergencies prompted significant confusion, sending some rushing to supermarkets to purchase extra supplies of cooking oil and rice. Residents say they were not worried about possible shortages. Vegetables are way too expensive, but even so, what can we do? It's not like you can manage without vegetables. Because of pandemic, the matters are hard to predict. The government's goal is to make people's lives easier. State media has sought to reassure the public that there are plentiful supplies of Beijing resident surname ASIC goods. Chinese state broadcaster CCTV reported that there had been some overinterpretation of the ministry's advice. And that's the wrap up. Stay safe, stay healthy, have a lovely weekend with your loved ones. See you.